Thank you, Justin. I was so delighted during the uh, 20th anniversary celebration to not have Justin and I recreate our Flava Flav moment. Uh, we did that years ago and demonstrated forever that I have no rhythm. Uh, but take your teaching notes out. If you were here last week, um, I didn't get enough of you, so I had to come back. And if you were not here last week, I came back for you. I needed to see you. I needed to see you. So it's great to have you here. If you take your teaching notes out, um, I really was praying, ask the Lord, what, what do you want me to say to Life Point Church at this time? This is as you begin your 21st uh, year of ministry and as you think about what's ahead, what should I talk about? And I really felt uh, impelled and compelled to do uh, this particular teaching, I think the Lord gave me, and I've had a chance to share it a number of places, so I want to share it now at LifePoint. I remember exactly where I was, and I remember exactly the circumstances. I was staying in San Ramon, California, and I was uh, pastoring here at LifePoint Church. I was staying in San Ramon in a hotel. I got up uh, uncharacteristically early, and uh, usually when I travel, especially if I travel without my wife, uh, unless there's really a super intense sporting event, I do not turn the TV on. It's just a distraction. It's a variety of other things. So for me, it's just a personal discipline, not saying it's a problem if you do, but I don't turn the TV on. But for whatever reason, I was there to speak to a group of pastors, and I woke up really early, uncharacteristically early, about 5.30 in the morning or so, and I turned on the television. As I turned on the television, the coffee began to brew in the room, and I began to think about what was going on, go on in that day, the things that I was going to speak about, and began to prepare. And as I did, I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something on the TV. And I was drawn to the TV. And as I was drawn to the TV, I was drawn to the TV at the exact moment that the second plane hit the second towers. I immediately knew that something was horrifyingly wrong, and I picked up the phone, I called my wife, woke Pam up and said, hey, you've got to turn the TV on, something's going on in New York. About an hour later or so, an hour and a half later, went downstairs, a lot of the pastors had gathered, they were all kind of thinking about what do we do, what do we do, and do we continue with this event, and the heart of most of the pastors present was, no, there's no way we can continue with this event. We ended up praying for a couple hours, and then I got on the road, traffic was terrible, uh, Pastor Roy, Tracy, many others who were here at the time had convened a prayer gathering. And that prayer gathering was an intense prayer gathering. People were burdened. Some of you will remember 2001, 9-11 and what happened. And I remember exactly where I was. For some of you, you'll remember, for instance, uh, some of you, perhaps a very few, remember Pearl Harbor. You'll remember the Kennedy assassination and exactly where you were at that moment in time. Maybe you remember the Challenger explosion. Or more re recently, maybe you remember where you were when you heard about the Parkland shooting. The topic I'd like to talk about today is what happens in your life when a crisis takes place. A crisis that you can't predict and you can't control. You didn't schedule it on your calendar, it just happened. Uh, some of you who remember the chronology will remember that months before 9-11, I had another event in my life that I couldn't plan or control. In April of 2011, it was at my house in Genoa, and I got a call about 4.45 in the afternoon from my sister. Her name's Tammy. As soon as I heard Tammy's voice, and I apologize for this, but I just always goof on my sister. She's younger than me. So as soon as I heard her voice, I started goofing on her. You know, being an older brother, started picking on her a little bit. And she said, John, be quiet. And I remember the tone of her voice and the exact words she said. She said, John, be quiet. Dad's been in an accident. He's not expected to live. Mom's on her way to the hospital. I'm going there. Get there as soon as you can. So here we are in northern Nevada, hospital in South Orange County. My brother and I who lived here, another brother lived in Reno, we all got down there as quick as we could. It wasn't on my calendar for that day. I couldn't predict that crisis. I couldn't control that crisis. And all of a sudden, everything that was on the calendar went out the window. And that became sort of the galvanizing moment. So I want to ask you to think about what happens in your life when oops takes place? What happens in your life when an oh my goodness? What happens when a letter, a call, a conversation, a circumstance happens and you didn't plan it? You can't control it. You can't predict it. Well, I believe the single greatest teacher that's ever lived, the person who demonstrates for us what it's like to be God in the flesh and to walk in human experience is Jesus. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, there's kind of a well-known story. It's a fascinating story. And I was pondering this story a number of years ago and really felt like the Lord had directed me to some specific understandings. 
Now quickly, uh, John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin, he's out in the wilderness and he's preaching a message of repentance. He's basically telling religious people, I don't care how religious you are, your heart's in the wrong place. He's preaching at people who kind of have a form of religious things. In other words, they went to church and carried their Bible and did all the right God stuff. But the reality is their hearts were far from God. And he's telling them to repent. Good Jewish people, he's telling them to repent and to be baptized. And by the way, that was offensive. It was offensive to tell good religious people that what you need to do is you need to come into the water like a Gentile, a non-Christian, be buried under the water, be raised back up to demonstrate your repentance from your lifestyle. Now, by the way, if you're a really religious person, to repent of your lifestyle is a horrifying thing. So John the Baptist is out there preaching, and he's telling people to repent and to be baptized, and Jesus comes to him. Now, you can imagine if you're John the Baptist and you know exactly who Jesus is, you've already said to the crowds that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And so when Jesus shows up, you, you, you point to him and say, this is the Lamb of God. And then we read in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized to, by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Or something like that. It was a big, booming voice. Now, when that happened, we kind of read that and go like, Oh, that's cool. Jesus decided to be baptized by John. Isn't that sweet? And if you read it that way, you are not understanding the text. You are not being present in that place. So for just a moment, I want you to imagine being in first century Palestine. I want you to imagine being on the banks of the Jordan River. John the Baptist has already pointed to Jesus and said, this is the Messiah. This is God come in the flesh to save us from our sins. He's pointed to Jesus and said, this is the one who has promised for ages. You've been waiting for him. So the people are all gathered on the shore. They're listening to John preach. And then Jesus comes and says, I want to be baptized. And John says, Jesus, I can't baptize you. You're the Messiah. There's no way I could baptize you in a baptism of repentance. And Jesus says, no, let it be done to fulfill. He was demonstrating a model of righteousness, and it's amazing. And if you were there and you saw everything, your mind would literally be blown. So I think we have a picture. Our first picture is the picture of the way the text says it. I hope we have a picture. Do we have a picture? Please, dear Jesus, help us have a picture. Not that one. Is there a picture? There's not a picture of a dove in there? There's no picture. Okay, Jesus eliminated the picture. All right, there's no picture. So I want you to imagine the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove. And I want you to imagine that dove coming down and being on Jesus and then hearing a voice from heaven, which I shared with you earlier. I want you to know that every time I read this passage, I am struck with a couple things. The first thing is the Holy Spirit coming like a dove. Because for me, the Holy Spirit doesn't come like a dove. I lived in Carson Valley for 13 years. The Holy Spirit doesn't come like a dove. He should come like a screaming eagle. I really believe he should come like a screaming eagle out of the sky. And he should land on Jesus. And people should be panicked and freaked out. And if I was there doing the movie, that's the way I would set it up. But I don't know about you. Occasionally, I watch movies. And I think they should have ended earlier than they do like maybe 30 minutes worth, right? But at the end of the day, sometimes when I read the Bible, it doesn't end where I thought it should. If it were me, I would end the story with Jesus, the Lamb of God, being baptized to fulfill all righteousness, Holy Spirit descending from heaven in the form of a dove, and being able to say, this is my beloved son, that voice from heaven. I would have ended the movie there had Jesus enter in triumphantly into Jerusalem, proclaim his kingship, have everybody follow him. That's the end of the movie. That's the triumphal end. And then, of course, you have a series of, of additional runs. You have next sort of edition. You have follow-up movies. But that movie should have ended there. But it doesn't. And every once in a while, when the movie doesn't end like it's supposed to, I'm frustrated. And I find that God is drilling down to a place in my soul that I don't go of my own choosing. So in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we read these verses. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, you think? Uh, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now again, maybe you read scripture and you think of scripture as a nice sort of God thing. It's sort of Hallmark, Hallmark cards that's been sanitized over the years. It's nice little Bible stuff. But when I read the Bible, I'm thinking this is God talking to us. And every once in a while when I read the Bible, I come across phrases where it does not fit with my picture of God or spiritual life. So I want to say to you again, when you read this passage, I hope you get stuck a little bit. Let's show the next slide. I want to read it for you out loud. I apologize for having PowerPoint challenges. I want you to realize in, in John chapter or Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. Jesus was led into the spirit, into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was being led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit of God who came down on Jesus also led him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. I don't know about you, but the first several times I read that, my response was not spiritual. My response was, what the heck? Why is God allowing his son Jesus to be led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? He goes 40, 40 days, he's super hungry, and all of a sudden, the devil comes to him and tempts him. And guess what his first temptation is? Food, yeah. Like he's in this almost carb fascination stage. And the first thing that the enemy says is, you can have carbs. And by the way, the enemy knew that Jesus had the power to turn the stones into bread. Jesus had already demonstrated his power. And the, and the enemy of his soul knew that he could turn the stones into bread. The enemy knew who he was talking to. So all he did was say to Jesus, just exercise your divine power and get out of this situation. So the first few times I read this, I was really angry and frustrated. And then it became understandable to me. This story of Jesus in the desert is a story that equips you and equips me to know how to handle crisis that you don't plan for, that you didn't predict, how do you handle that in your life? Because I don't know what you're facing right now, and I don't know what you will face in the future. But I will say this to you. If you're not in the desert now, or you haven't been in the desert in the past, you will someday go into a desert. Just a quick little question. How many of you have ever been in a desert in your life? Okay. It's pretty common. And sometimes people say, well, if I'm really spiritual, I'll never go into a desert. I don't get that in the Bible. Like Bible people who love God and surrender and sacrifice their lives for him face desert experiences. So don't buy the lie that spiritual life and spiritual maturity somehow means freedom from pain, freedom from suffering, freedom from challenge. Understand, however, that Jesus is teaching us something here. So here's the first fill in the blank that I want you to do in your notes. First of all, realize that you're not alone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, realize this, you'll never be tempted. You can look at this passage later. You'll never be tempted beyond what you can bear. Every time you face a temptation, God provides a way of escape. When you are facing temptation, when you're facing a desert, when you're facing a pain, when you got that call from the doctor's office, when you got that bill in the mail that is unpayable and unsolvable, when you face that relationship breakdown, you are not alone. God is present there. And Jesus teaches us, after 40 days of being uh, tempted in the desert by the devil, Jesus teaches us that the reality is, is that we are never alone. So I don't know what you're going through now, have been uh, through in the past, or will go through in the future, but I know this, you are not alone. If you have a relationship with Jesus, the psalmist says that there's no place I can go from his presence. There's no depth, there's no height, there's no end of the universe that you can go away from the presence of God. You are not alone. Second thing I want you to know in this passage is that we need to respond by wearing the full armor of God. I don't have time this morning to unpack it because Roy wouldn't give me two hours. But it's awesome that you gave me more than seven minutes. It's totally good. This is, this is great this morning. But I, I want you to know that uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about spiritual armor. And a lot of times we fly right by passages like that and go, oh, yeah, we should put on the full armor. We read the little things and breastplate and belt and sword and shield and yeah, yeah, and shod with the gospel of peace. And we read that stuff and we don't think it relates to us. I'm telling you, every single piece of the spiritual armor mentioned in Ephesians 6 is how you prepare yourself. How you prepare yourself for an event in your life that you cannot control and you cannot predict. 
do not equate spiritual maturity with an absence of pain, suffering, or challenge. Spiritual maturity is recognizing that you're never alone. And spiritual maturity is having the full armor of God on you. When Jesus Christ went in the desert to be tempted by Satan, immediately following this glorious baptism where he heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. When he went there, he did not go alone. And he went there fully girded up for battle. He was ready to face whatever he had to face. And I want to say to you gently and carefully that sometimes what I observe in our life as followers of Jesus is that we go into challenges wholly unprepared. We want to microwave spirituality. We want to hurry up and get right and tight with Jesus. And the truth is, my friends, a relationship with Jesus is like a lifelong experience of a crock pot. It's not a microwave. And if you do crock pot cooking well, all the flavors of all the elements end up seasoning the experience. Every experience you've had in your life, by the way, is part of the testimony that God is weaving in you. And by the way, if you're here today and go like, hey, I don't really know anything about God, Bible, Jesus, church, like they just, somebody invited me here today, told me they'd take me out to breakfast afterwards. Well, by the way, if you invited them here and you told them you'd take them out for breakfast, you take them out, okay? And when you take them out, you tip the server really well, okay? Because it's a very bad thing when Christians go out and do not tip the servers well. So I come from a long a line of family people who served in restaurants. Please tip well. But I want to tell you this. If you're here and you don't know anything about God, Bible, Jesus, and the church, you're in the right place. This is a warm, loving place that, that you can discover and explore. But I'm telling you this. The danger is to think that spiritual life somehow happens in a microwave kind of fashion. It doesn't. It's a crock pot kind of experience. And you have to have the full armor of God so that you're prepared to face those unpredicted, uncontrollable situations. Last one, the third thing I want you to write down is that uh, real, real, uh, resolve never to go into the desert without wet hair. Resolve never to go into the desert without wet hair. Now, what do I mean by that? Jesus experienced his baptism immediately before his temptation. And that is actually a common narrative in Scripture. The highest heights that people climb to spiritually are often followed by the greatest depths of challenge. The highest heights of victory that people often experience in Scripture are often immediately followed by the greatest depths of challenge. That is a relatively common narrative in Scripture. And I believe this. When the Holy Spirit led Jesus from his baptism, voice of God, Holy Spirit descending like a screaming eagle. I know it says dove. Descending like a screaming eagle. The reality is, is that Jesus Christ went into the desert with his hair still wet from his baptism. I pray that you will be prepared to face whatever comes your way with your hair still wet in the desert. Can we go to the next slide? Does it have John 15 there? John 15? Yes, God is good. Okay, John 15. Here's what it says. Remain in me. This is Jesus talking. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Psalm 1. We have Psalm 1 up there next. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners or sit in the seat of the mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Look up here. John 15 tells us that unless you abide in relationship with Jesus, the word for abide means remain, consistently remain, consistently stay connected. Unless you rem remain in Jesus, you cannot bear fruit. And I just want to say this very quickly. It's possible to come to church and not be connected to Jesus. I know that might be offensive to you, but look, I was born and raised in the church. I've experienced times in my life where I was coming to church, I was being faithful, and then hold on to your seats. I was even a pastor and not necessarily having my heart in the right condition with God. Jesus tells us, unless we remain in Him, unless we abide in His presence, unless we stay with our hearts connected to Him, we cannot bear fruit. Psalm 1 tells us, the verse that you're looking at now, Psalm 1 tells us this, 
that if we walk in the counsel of God, we get God's word coming in our life. We're surrounded by people who love us. We get God's word coming in our life that we're like a tree planted by living waters. Now, I've gotten a little bit off the harvest cycle here, but I want to just ask you this very quick question. If you came by an apple tree in March, a month from now, you came by an apple tree in March and there were no ripe apples on it, would you be angry? No, why not? It's not season. Some, I don't know the exact thing right here in Carson Valley, but somewhere in the fall, September, October, November, is harvest season for apples. It would be a terrible disservice to an apple tree if you went to an apple tree in February, March, April and said, hey, there's no mature fruit on here, cut it down. Here's my problem with the way many of us do the Christian life. We expect that every season of our lives is harvest season. And I am telling you that there are some seasons of our lives where the roots of our soul are digging deep into the spirit of the living God. Not every season is harvest season. Every season, John 15, we need to stay connected to the vine, but not every season is harvest season. Sometimes when you're in the desert, what's happening is you're being tested, you're being challenged, you're facing crises. When I went through the death of my father, when we went through the experience of 9-11 as a church family, what God did was amazing and awesome, and it was horrible while it was taking place. Most people don't know this from a data standpoint, but I'm a little bit of a data geek. So let me tell you, at LifePoint Church, it was then CVC back then, uh, we grew 15% before 9-11. God had already been preparing our hearts, and we were experiencing a, 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 an enlarging of our outreach into the community. When 9-11 happened, churches across America were flooded with people. And you know how long that lasted? Six weeks. Demographics across the country said for six weeks, 9-11 caught people's attention, and they went to church in record numbers. Guess what happened after six weeks? Church attendance went back to normal. Guess what happened to then CBC? We grew 15% before 9-11. And because of the way this body, this family, this house was prepared to minister people in the midst of 9-11, we grew by another 15%. So we enlarged our congregation by one-third of people that we could serve and minister to, come to Christ in that time period. Why do we do that? I believe it's because we bore fruit in the right season. But if you simply say, hey, it's harvest time. Come on now, let's get to microwave and let's get to September, October, November. Let's bear some fresh apples. It doesn't work that way. So I don't know when you're going to get the call. I don't know when you're going to face a piece of mail you didn't want. I don't know when you're going to have a relational challenge because look, life's unpredictable, right? I don't know if you've lived a straight line life, but if you have, man, I want to talk to you because my life has not been straight line. There's been a few zigs and zags. How many of you agree? Life happens, right? You know, it just, It does. So when life happens, if you are equipped in the soul, if you are equipped in the depths of your being to say, Jesus, you and me can handle anything. You and Jesus are a majority, by the way, in every situation. You win because you press into him and you follow under his cover. So the last several years, I've been learning a few things. I just want to quickly share them with you here. I've been learning a lot about kingdom presence. Do we have that slide? Do we have a slide? We don't have a slide. Do we? Kingdom presence, that's awesome. Do we have anything after that? This is just going to be a walk by faith. Proverbs, and then it's in a parenthesis. That's awesome. I am so totally, let's just stop right here. Let me just say that nothing that you're now experiencing that relates to technical problem is the technical team's fault. Would you honor them and thank them? <laughs> by the way, in churches where I go, periodically I'll stop. I feel like the Lord wants me to do that. I'll stop and I'll actually honor the tech team because they're one of the many teams in the church that serve without ever getting notice unless something goes wrong. So I want you to hear that anything that's going wrong on the screen is my fault. It's not theirs. Okay? Now that we're okay with that, just hang in there with me. Don't give up on me, okay? Is it Ricky? Is Ricky, are you ready? Don't give up on me, okay? Just hang in there. All right. I've been learning a lot about kingdom presence. So just in your notes, just write these things down very quickly. Write down these words. Presence, dependence, abundance, presence, dependence, abundance, joy, and peace. What I have learned is that an increasing awareness of the presence of God makes you increasingly dependent upon Him. 
I'm thankful for our worship here. I'm thankful for all that God has done in the life of this church. But I got to tell you, when I come to worship, I don't try to focus on whether the notes are played right. Well, I know anyway, I'm not musically inclined. But I don't focus on whether the notes were played right or whether the sound was right. I try to say, Jesus, I want to be in your presence. I want to connect my heart to your heart. I thank you for the skilled and gifted musicians and worship leaders. I thank you for the hospitality folks. I thank you for the parking lot folks. I thank you for the security folks and the children's ministry and everybody who's been a part of making this possible. But my hope is not to connect with the external reality of what's happening, but all that external reality to lead me into the place where I connect my heart to the heart of God. The more I connect to the heart of God, the more I become dependent upon Him because I realize how awesome and amazing He is. And basic me, I'm just me, and I, I know all my stuff, or at least a good portion of it. So presence, dependence. And when that dependence increases, then abundance happens. And what abundance happens? It's not because of me. It's abundance because of Him. The abundance is that overflow of heart where I recognize that God is God and I'm not. And He begins to fill my heart and fill my soul. And then from abundance comes joy and peace. Let me say a couple other things that I've been learning. This will be, I think, encouraging to you. I've learned that God is the God of the impossible and unexplainable. He's the God of the impossible and unexplainable. I really believe He's a God of order and not of chaos. Scripture teaches us that. But He's also the God of the nonlinear. God is the God of the impossible and unexplainable. I can't explain what happens in life, but many times God intersects and things happen in exponential and accelerated fashion, and you know that God's hand is on it when it wasn't about your effort and your strength and your wisdom and all of that. He's the God of the impossible and unexplainable. And then finally, I want you to think about your walk with God, not as a sprint or a marathon, but as interval training. There's times when you walk with God where you run as fast as you can, and then there's other seasons where you walk and you recover. And then there's other times where you run as fast as you can and then you walk and you recover. So I don't know what season you're in. I don't know if you're in a season of walking. Like just getting through each day is the spiritual agenda. Just keeping your eyes on him and walking through that reality. Or if where you are right now is the reality that you are running full tilt because he's called you to chase after something. Whatever season that you're in, when it's harvest season, the fruit that you bear in your life will come from Him and not from any human being. He'll be shaping your life. Now, He's placed you in community. He's placed you in family. But He's done that so you can grow to maturity. Last scripture, Proverbs chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, and the knowledge of Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and your years will be added to your life. Jesus was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. John the Baptist tried to stop him, and Jesus said, no, let this be done. And he was taken under the water, and then when he came up, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, but it was actually a screaming eagle. And he descended on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And if you're anything like me, you stop the movie there and roll the credits. But the Bible says, Then the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And for 40 days he was tempted by Satan. But he wasn't alone. He had the full armor of God and his hair was still wet from his baptism when he faced those temptations. Now I suspect that the Holy Spirit will not lead you into the desert to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. But I have no idea what you'll face in your life. I have no idea what these last 40 days have brought or these next 40 days will bring, but I know this. If you will go into whatever desert circumstance of your life with your hair still wet, from your experience and encounter with a living Christ. And if you will walk with the full armor of God, you will be able to face any temptation, any trial, any struggle in the strength of the Lord. So I just want to pray over you. And I want to enter into prayer that you be girded up for whatever he's challenging you to face. The best days of this church are ahead. They're not behind. 
the greatest mountains to climb are not behind, they're ahead. And the greatest impact in this community lies just ahead. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? With your eyes closed, I want to be able to pray over you right now. And again, some of you in this room may go like, oh, wow, that, that was intense. And I don't, I don't even really know where I stand with Jesus. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, I just want you to know you are here in the right place. I'm glad that you're here in this safe place where you can explore a spiritual life and questions. And if you want to come up afterwards and talk to one of the prayer team or chat with somebody in the hallway, brought with the, talk with the person who brought you and just say, man, what is all this about a God who loves and cares deeply for us? A God who can forgive us of our past and secure us in our future and are in our present and give us a hope for the future. Or maybe you're at the place today where you say, look, I just really want to know. I just really want to know that no matter what happens in my life, no matter what physical, emotional, relational, financial, medical, or any other form of challenge, that I am going to be victorious because I'm going to walk every day with Jesus. And with your eyes still closed, let me tell you that when Billy Graham died this week, that what happened for Billy is he was released from this address to go to the address that had been prepared for him years ago. And my personal belief is that because Billy walked with God, that when he arrived in heaven, he knew he'd already been there. Because I believe that when we walk with God every day on planet Earth, that we get to experience a little bit of heaven because the presence of God surrounds us wherever we go. Life's not divided into sacred and secular. It's holy. And everywhere you walk, when you walk with God, you're experiencing the presence of heaven. Would you, with your eyes closed, Jesus right now, Holy Spirit, would you move across this congregation? I pray that there would be an upsurge of faith and hope I pray that across this congregation there would be a deep and exciting desire to experience life. None of us wants to be led in the desert to be tempted. None of us want to face those desert times. But Jesus, we declare here and now that we are going into the desert with our hair wet from our encounter with you. We're not going alone. We're going to go fully geared up. We're going to have the full armor of God. And we are going to go with our hair wet. Thank you for your presence and your love and your grace.